Okay. Well, in this lecture, we'll be talking about, I believe, chapter two in your textbook, which deals with radiation type sources and the need for dose limitation. And the learning objectives I have here are, um, we're going to define radiation. We, we gave it a loose definition, particularly ionizing radiation. Um, last week, we'll get down a little bit further into that definition. Some of it may be a repeat, but it's helpful to repeat it. Um, we're going to talk about different types of radiation and what they look like. And so the activity today will be related to drawing out what these different types of radiation look like. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about radiation protection and the rationale for use. Uh, now, depending on the type of radiation that we're protecting for, those protection measures will be different. So the protection measures in the nuclear medicine department are different from those we use in the x-ray department. Um, then, finally, we'll talk about patient education and we'll define Alara and BERT. So, radiation is an energy. That means that it, it does work, right? Anything that does work, we can call an energy. And in this case, uh, doing work means that, uh, this is awful, but it likes to move it, move it, right? It moves stuff, right? Um, the it is stuff that doesn't want to move. So if it don't want to move, doing work is causing it to move, right? So radiation has the ability to do work. Um, radiation specifically is a kinetic form of energy. That means it's moving through space. It has a vector, it has a trajectory. Um, and there's a crap ton of different types. Right? So let's get a little bit further down into this definition. So radiation equals a transmitted form of energy. One of the first things that I think about when I think about radiation for me as an x-ray tech is that it's an electromagnetic phenomenon. But that's not the full definition of radiation, right? So there is one um, specific type of radiation, right? that is electromagnetic, right? Well, what does that mean? That means that it follows this waveform equation, right? And most of that electromagnetic ionizing radiation, um, we say it behaves like a wave and also behaves like a particle. It exists in this wave-particle duality thing. And if you really want to get freaked out, look up wave-particle duality and the, what's called the double-slit experiment where they're looking at is radiation, is electromagnetic a, wa a, a wave, or is it a particle? What is the quanta of a photon? But the way that I tend to remember the way that it's doing work goes back to uh, this scene in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation where this police officer says to Clark, that was pretty low, mister. If I had a rubber hose, I would beat you with it, right? Classic scene. The, why, do, why do I think about that? Well, if I had a rubber hose in this classroom strung from this wall to that wall, and I'm making waveforms in it, right, rolling it up and down, the speed with which I am rolling that rubber hose up and down is the frequency, right? So the important thing to understand about electromagnetic wave lengths is they are not traveling any faster. They all travel at the speed of light. They all travel at a constant. The only way that their energy changes is by the degree to which they're oscillating up and down, the degree to which that rubber hose is beating Clark in this case, right, is the energy. That's what we're talking about when we talk about electromagnetic waves, right? Now, the term electromagnetic has both electric and magnetic in it because electricity and magnetic fields are fluctuating as these things pass by. So, for example, if anyone's seen the movie Chernobyl, or if you've ever been around when there's a solar flare activity, you know that it affects radio waves, right? So radiation, if there's sufficient amounts of electromagnetic radiation, it affects um, radio waves. Why, how does it affect radio waves? Well, it's causing fluctuations in electromagnetic fields, right? In magnetic fields and electrical fields. We can sense some of those things even within the Earth's magnetic fields. So, um, all of these waveforms, though, that are forms, a form of radiation have both a frequency and a wavelength. 
And I've mentioned that they also have the ability to act like particles. They can interact with atoms in the body or atoms in the universe as though they were particles. They can cause atoms to undergo chemical changes. They can cause atoms to lose electrons. They can even destroy the nucleus of an atom if they have sufficient energy. So they can do things like a particle, right? So it's an electromagnetic phenomena, but it can behave like a particle, right? So, show us this. So I just want to uh, illustrate that the patient is thinking about something completely different. So as we're having this discussion, continue to bear in mind how a patient might perceive some of what we're saying, right? And what are some of the barriers that we have to educating our patients about this subject, even if it relates to their care. So. Regardless of all of that, though, um, for the most part, when we're talking about ionizing radiation in terms of the electromagnetic type of ionizing radiation, it's something that exists on the electromagnetic spectrum. It is anything, in general, that is um, ultraviolet and higher, right? So what's interesting is you get, if you're looking at wavelength, right? You've got microwave, you've got radio waves, those have really long wavelengths, right? Then you get to the visible light spectrum, the actual spectrum of energies that we're able to perceive with our eyes. And you have on one side of it infrared, stuff that's less than red is what that means. We can't perceive it because it's less than red. We travel through the visible light spectrum and we exit on ultraviolet. It's something that's more than violet is what that means. Um, and once we're in that ultraviolet range, the wavelengths are short enough, the frequency is high enough, we can start to cause ionization from electromagnetic radiation. So anything greater than um, ultraviolet. Ultraviolet and greater than is capable of producing ionization. It is ionizing radiation. So there we go, ionizing radiation. What does that mean? Well, it means anything that can interact with an atom and create an ion, right? Uh, so, again, I know this is a review of some of what we had in physics, but we had a, a photon that's interacting with this atom on the left, and as a result, we have an ion pair that results. An ion pair are these two particles, a atom with a net positive charge because it lost an electron, an electron with a net negative charge. We'll call that an ion. All right, well, where does this stuff come from, right? And I've intentionally not mentioned particulate stuff yet. But it is helpful to think about where do we find this stuff? Is it na natural? Is it man-made? So there are naturally occurring radiation sources, right? Part of the environment. Uh, there's terrestrial sources. I've mentioned spring water has some amount of radioactivity in it, right? Cosmic radiation as well as internal radiation. There's also man-made types of radiation. These would be artificially produced radiation. So when we talk about the radiation that was produced um, by the uh, acceleration of that uranium bullet towards the uranium target with, within um, that bomb, we're talking about an artificial radiation source, right? They took the uranium, they refined it, they put it in this mechanism that caused the radiation to be released. So the same would be true on question two in the quiz. Even though the bomb was stuck in the ground, it is not a terrestrial radiation source. It is an artificial radiation source because it was something that was refined and produced and had a technology to it. Now, within each of these sources, right, um, there are different types, right? There are different types. And so you'll notice what I'm referring to as a source, right, are these things, like whether it's terrestrial, whether it's cosmic, where did it come from? Where did it come from? What was its point of origin? And all of these sources, both natural and man-made, we'll revisit it when we look at that pie chart, all of these contribute to the population's radiation dose, right? So the radiation that you and I receive over the course of our lifetime will be a combination of both natural and artificial radiation doses. So we talk about sometimes how we live 
in an information age, right? That this is the information age. I really think that the more accurate description of the age that we live in is we live in an atomic age. Um, that was the term that they used after the use of the, the atomic bomb. Um, using uh, the technology that we, de we developed a to develop nuclear bomb as well as a lot of medical technology, it informs almost everything that we do. Um, so the development of supercomputers. Why did we develop supercomputers? Well, it was to do the complex math required to understand how to build a nuclear bomb, right? Why do, why do, we, why do we need big data, right? What are we doing with this data? A lot of it is being used to understand medical data, and a lot of that medical data is things like radiation treatment plans and x-rays. Okay, but there's different types, right? There are different types. So the word type has to do with what type of radiation that I actually interact with. So we can think about this irregardless of the source, right? So for example, cosmic radiation, can it can produce um, electromagnetic phenomena. It can also produce particulate stuff, right? So, going back to what occurred when we used the atomic bomb on Japan, we have a uranium bullet that was fired at a uranium target. That is a particle. Those are things on the periodic table. That is a particulate form of radiation, right? Um, versus the x-rays or gamma rays that are released by a particle, those are purely electromagnetic. If we want to know why this matters, right? Um, well, it is helpful to be able to think about it this way. I love it when the ultrasound techs say, we don't use any radiation. Well, really, then how did you get any pictures? You are using a form of radiation. It is a mechanical form of radiation, right? You are still doing work, right? So it is, it is not accurate to say you're not using radiation. It is accurate to say you're not using ionizing radiation. Right? You're not using ionizing radiation. But are there effects to doing work on things? Yes, there are. And so, in my opinion, ultrasound's not quite out of the woods yet in terms of determining if it has some bearing on, on the life and, and health of uh, babies and stuff like that. I wouldn't just use ultrasound willy-nilly. Electromagnetic stuff, though, it does cause ionization. So there's the ionization pony there, right? All that, so electromagnetic stuff, once you get to ultraviolet, anything south of ultraviolet on this can cause ionization, therefore it's electromagnetic wave. And the final one, the reason that the, uh, the nuclear medicine pony is in this radioactive uh, trash can or whatever that is, is because it's the dirty stuff, if we're honest, right? The particulate stuff, we are gonna have to exercise extra caution with because we do not want to be inhaling this stuff, we don't want to be ingesting this stuff, we don't want to be spilling it on anything, um, because it can create some real significant problems if we don't watch carefully how we're using it. So those are different types. So in general, we should not use the term type or anything to refer to ionizing or non-ionizing radiation, right? Um, these are just uh, umbrella terms that are helpful. The way that we can talk about them is do they have sufficient energy to eject electrons from atoms or do they not? So all of this, this ability to do energy on atoms is the basis for the idea of dose. When we talk about a patient's absorbed dose, we're talking about what kind of work can this stuff do to atoms within the body, right? Um, so the, the foundation for uh, radiation dose is this understanding of ionization, whether that ionization occurred because of exposure to a particulate radiation or electromagnetic, we'll call it dose, radiation dose. Well, let's talk a little bit about these particulate sources. I'm talking about alpha particles, beta particles, neutrons, and protons. Each one of these is significant, and each one of them contributes to dose in different ways, and each one of them requires different levels and different ways of protecting ourselves from them. Um, for the most part, 
These are ejected from atoms at very high speeds, particularly if the atoms are undergoing some form of radioactive decay. Um, these particulate radiations differ in their ability to penetrate matter, right? So the way that I generally think about this is if I had a bowling ball and I was trying to play pool, all right? So there's my bowling ball. Here's the little tiny pool balls, right? So if I roll the bowling ball towards the pool balls, right? It is probably not going to get very far. It'll bang into the bowling, the, and it'll either totally destroy all the pool balls, right? Or it'll bang around. It's so big, it's not going to be able to get through them, right? You tracking with me? Versus, now let's imagine we're looking top down at the pool table. I've got the same uh, setup, but I've got some, some pool balls here set up around the table, and I've got now just another pool ball. Now the odds that this pool ball could figure out a way to get between these things is significant, right? It might bang into one or two, but it could possibly get through them. So the same kind of thing is happening at the microscopic level when we look at these different forms of particulate radiation. So in this example, the alpha particle, a bowling ball is like an alpha particle. It is very large, right? It is not going to get very far. It will be stopped. But in the course of being stopped, it's going to give off a ton of energy. It's going to do a lot of work, right? It's going to do that work really quickly. It's not going to get very far. Beta particles are roughly the size of an electron. And so they will not get very far, right? They're not going to get very far. I mean, I'm sorry. I take that back. They will not do much work, but they will go further. Right, I should say it that way, I'm sorry. So in this illustration here, we have our alpha particles are being stopped by a sheet of paper. Beta particles can be shot by, stopped by a layer of clothing or a few millimeters of skin, right? So these different types of particulate radiation can penetrate the body differently, right? Versus a gamma ray. If we have a gamma ray that's produced by a radioisotope, it could go straight through the body, straight through this building, and just keep on going. Whether or not it ionizes very much is a, is a good question. It may not ionize very many things, right? But it has a potential to keep going. It's not giving off much of its energy by ionization. So let's look at these a little bit more closely. Alpha particles are things that are emitted from the nuclei of super heavy elements, right? So uranium, plutonium. And it's emitted during this process of radioactive decay. These elements are so large, they basically are able to peel off um, an additional uh, particle, right? And in, in this instance, it would be basically a helium nucleus. So a helium nucleus just springs out of this very large particle. I say it's a helium nucleus because what it has is two protons and two neutrons. It does not have any electrons attached to it, right? It is just the nucleus of that helium atom. And we will call that a alpha particle. It has a tremendous amount of mass, roughly um, four times the mass of a hydrogen atom, right? And it will have a net positive charge, positive charge of two. And it's traveling at a very fast speed. So these are not going to be able to get through very much stuff, right? Um, they'll lose their energy quickly as they travel a short distance, right? So the main concern with this particulate type of radiation is that if, what happens if you eat it, right? What happens if it gets inside of your body? Um, if it's on my skin, I can just wash it off. But if it, is, if it gets deeper into my body, it can be significant, right? Anything that's giving off alpha particles. So for the most part, 
alpha particles, the good news with alpha particles is we do not use them for very much stuff in medicine. There is a rare alpha emitter that we might use in nuclear medicine, but they're pretty rare. Do you, can y'all think of any right now? When, when Kathy was here, she could rattle off a couple, and I can't think of any, um, but I'm not, again, nuclear medicine tech. So um, if, if we come up with some, maybe I'll ask Donna if there's any that are currently being used. They kind of come in and out of favor. Um, because of this issue that they have with being fairly localized. Now the good news is, is if we can start to develop targeted gene therapies like in nuclear medicine or radiation therapy, we have a way of getting, if we have a way of getting an alpha particle to a cancer or getting an alpha particle to a form of disease, um, then that targeted therapy would stay pretty close to the area of disease, right? So it has promise. I don't want us to discount it altogether. Mm. So, again, we want to be careful of not ingesting this or bringing these into our body in any way, shape, or form, right? Um, and again, the joke here with the radioactive bananas, bananas are moderately radioactive, like really, really small amounts of radiation um, are there. And most of it's uh, what, potassium-40. It's a naturally occurring radioisotope of potassium. Okay, beta particles. These are the same thing as high-speed electrons except for their origin, right? So. The, the source is important, again, to go back to uh, maybe the radiation therapy treatment suite. If we've got a patient and we're giving a, a breast cancer boost, right, we may use the electron cone. We may place something on the linear accelerator that just allows us to treat the skin with electrons, right? Those are not beta particles. They are just high-speed electrons, right? They're doing the exact same thing that a beta particle would do. Where do they differ? They differ in their source. In the instance of the linear accelerator, the source is a form of thermionic emission similar to what happens inside of the x-ray tube. So we produce these electrons, we accelerate them towards the patient using microwaves, and then um, they interact with the patient's skin. Versus beta rays or beta particles, their source is a radioisotope. So the isotope undergoes a radioactive decay, it emits a little tiny electron, right? And it has a net charge of negative one. And this means that this beta particle will not interact as strongly with stuff in its environment. It is more penetrating though. So it is gonna have less of an interaction, but it can travel further, it can travel further. So here's an example of, again, high-speed electrons that are not beta radiation. So they can penetrate more deeply, and they can't be stopped by an ordinary piece of paper like, like the alpha particle, right? Um, if they've got sufficient energy, they could potentially travel um, through uh, like a, a short distance of wood or some of the skin. All right, protons. These are positively charged components of an atom. Um, they have relatively small mass, uh, but they're still much, much larger than an electron. So the number of protons, the main thing we need to remember about the number of protons is that uh, the, its atomic number, the proton count determines what the element is, right? Sometimes we refer to that the atomic number or the Z number. When we look at the number of protons, we know what, what element it is. Okay, neutrons. So can we have proton or neutron contamination caused by different types of radiation? Yes, we can. Um, in fact, one of the most difficult ones to detect is the neutron. Now, put on your thinking caps. Why would a neutron be very, very difficult to detect? It doesn't have any positive or a neutron. Great. It has no charge whatsoever, right? It's completely neutral. 
um, it has no charge. So these are very, very difficult to detect. Um, we will look at cases where individuals had neutron contamination and we were not able to determine what type of radiation sickness they had going on. There was a, a KGB double agent who defected to Great Britain about 10 years ago. Lubachek, I think was his name. And he was given some source of radiopharmaceutical in a cup of tea, right, by KGB agents or Russian double agents. And they poisoned him with the radio with the radiation, with the radioisotope. The radioisotope that they chose to poison him with was primarily decaying through neutron. It was producing neutrons, right? So there was no way to detect that this man was being poisoned from within by this neutron contamination. When Scotland Yard showed up at the hospital, they could not figure out what was going on with the guy. There wasn't alpha particles coming out of him. There was nothing being sweated out of his skin that they could detect. There was not gamma rays coming out of his body. But they had no way of knowing that the man had been radiation poisoned. All, outwardly, all the manifest signs and symptoms looked like radiation poisoning, but they couldn't figure out what it was. Um, it took them several days to figure it out. By that time, he had died of um, CNS syndrome from radiation poisoning, and they called his autopsy the most dangerous autopsy in the history of the world. Right? They wound up having to fill his, his apartment with concrete. They had to fill his cars with concrete. There was so much contamination left all over the city of London by this one person, neutron contamination, right? The reason I'm telling you that grisly story, right, is particularly in my work as a radiation therapist, we talked a lot about the neutron trap and how you, you know, don't lean on the radiation treatment door or whatever because there's neutron contamination in the room, in the treatment room, after we do patient treatments. That is true, right? And here's the thing, this can't detect it. So you could have a radiation badge monitor, monthly monitoring thing that says nothing. You're doing great. But unless it's got a little special packet on the back that's bright yellow, this is not designed to catch neutron contamination. All right? So it's something to be aware of. It's, it is an occupational hazard that I don't think we understand enough about. But these, are electronic, these electrically neutral particles um, have roughly the same mass as a proton. Um, and they're given off during radioactive decay, right? Um, so they are actually what contribute to the instability of a particle. When we list a radioisotope, we give a count that's with the total number of protons and neutrons inside of it, right? Um, so we know roughly what its full atomic weight is. That um, that is, those additional neutrons are what are producing the instability for the atom and the reason it wants to go and undergo decay. Okay, so this is our activity for today, right? You can either work independently or in a group to draw the following types of radiation, right? Draw them out. Um, you can make them cartoon form, whatever. You can use your textbook, that's fine. You can use the internet, but I want you to draw these things out on a piece of paper, right? Um, alpha decay, beta decay, and Bremstrahlung x-ray production, right? I know I didn't talk about that today, but um, find it in your notes, find it online, and draw each one of those. I will give you 17 minutes. Fifteen minutes. Great work on those illustrations. Okay. But like I said, my primary focus and the reason that we need to explore these different types of radiation, whether it's electromagnetic or whether it's particulate in nature, is because all of them have a potential to do biological damage. They can interrupt organic processes. They can affect things at the atomic level, the cellular level, the tissue level. All that these things are doing are essentially a form of trauma. They are traumatizing things at the microscopic level, right? So similar to a car, if a car was to collide into my body, it would produce significant amounts of trauma largely at the, at the organism level, right? 
These things are like little cars colliding into the body and they're causing significant amounts of trauma at the atomic and cellular level. Okay? So any of these radiations have the ability to penetrate the body's tissue and they will eject electrons from atoms that compose the tissue, right? breaking those atoms apart in essence. Uh, we can even destroy entire atoms inside of the patient with sufficient energy. Right? We can produce radioactive results inside of a patient with sufficient energy. Right? So it's helpful to look at things, to think about those changes that happen at a molecular level, at a cellular level, and then zooming out even further at the organic level. Um, but it does not take that much radiation to cause these changes. Right? So, for example, I said that the amount of radiation used in an x-ray exam, right, was uh, 0.01 millisieverts, right? Roughly equivalent to 10 days of natural background radiation, right? Well, at roughly 25 times that, in the range of what we do in CT, at 0.25 sieverts, we can do decrease lymphocyte counts. So whole body doses as low as 0.25 sieverts can reduce the lymphocytes in the body. They're super radiosensitive. So um, how do we figure this up? What are the ways that we're going to add this all up? Because it's, it's not particularly helpful um, to just talk about these strange things that are going on. There's little bowling balls rolling around or pool balls or however you want to talk about it or there's particulate stuff, there's electromagnetic stuff. We need ways to quantify what's occurring inside of an organic system, right? And the way that we talk about that is generally dose. And the way that we further break down dose, right, is to at four different levels. We can look at what we call an entrance skin exposure. How much of the patient's skin was exposed to the dose, right? because that can account for a lot of things. It can account for the alpha particles, the beta particles, the gamma rays, the x-rays. It can account for all of those interacting at the level of the skin. As we get more deep into the body, a lot of times what we have is we call a deep dose or a bone marrow dose. Um, that is measuring how much of the dose got just deposited deep to the patient's skin, so beyond the level of the skin. So now we're talking about an alpha particle couldn't do that unless it was internally ingested, right? But potentially an electron could, um, and an x-ray definitely could, a gamma ray could. Then there's gonadal dose, and this is because these are particularly sensitive parts of the body, right? We're interested in a gonadal dose because of its sensitivity, right? Um, and then finally, we can estimate a fetal dose. If we have the patient's entrance skin exposure, we know what their bone marrow dose is. We can, from that, we can kind of calculate what we, what we expect the, the fetus received, bearing in mind that mother basically worked as a shield around the fetus. So the fetus's dose we would expect to be less than the mom's entrance skin exposure. I'm going to skip over this little history lesson, but I do like Bill Wirtz, and his History of Japan video is pretty awesome. If you've never seen it, he does deal with the whole history of Japan, not just um, the use of atomic bombs uh, on Japan, but he looks at the effects of atomic bombs in the long term, and that's one of the things that we are interested in. When we talk about these doses, we are interested in the individual, but we're also looking at, over entire generations, what is the fallout of these types of exposures, right? Um, for the next generation, for the generation after that, how do we project out what could occur? When we're thinking about those effects on the future generation and effects on the individual, we have two different ways that we think about the effects of radiation on the body. The first is what we call a deterministic effect. I think about deterministic in this term, that it's the effect is determined by the dose amount. So the more uh, a dose, the more an effect, right? So these are things like burns and cataracts. There's a threshold, and beyond that threshold, we would expect to start to see burns. We would expect to start to see the development of cataracts in that individual, right? So those are determined by the dose. 
the amount of the effect is determined by the dose. Um, so this is an example of uh, someone who's received burns to their hand from radiation exposure. The hand has healed, but there is still scar tissue around the fingers, right? Um, so this was really common. Um, the way that hands, the hands of an early x-ray tech might have looked, right? Because they were handling an x-ray tube that was unshielded. They were, their hands were constantly being exposed to radiation. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about how um, a skin erythema dose or a skin reddening dose was the dosimetry of the time. In fact, they would just say, today you can work until you start to feel your hands tingle or your hands get numb, and then you probably need to call it a day. Right? That was the way that they monitored people's dose. Um, they didn't understand all these effects. Repeated doses to the hands of that amount um, eventually caused scarring. The burns caused scarring. The scarring uh, is unique to radiation, but it would look just like the scarring of any other burn. And that scarring is affecting things at the capillary level, so you start to lose digits because of necrosis. You, you can't use the hand anymore because the capillaries are being destroyed. There's not sufficient blood flow, and the, the uh, fingers become necrotic. Cataracts are interesting as well um, because they basically, are, it's a, a cloudiness in the lens of the eye. And if you can imagine the lens of the eye being something like a windshield, right? And you're driving behind a truck down the interstate that's got gravel in it, right? If you drive long enough behind that truck, how is your windshield going to look? It's going to start to look cloudy, right? It's going to start to take away some of the clarity of your windshield. The exact same thing is what we're seeing within the, the cataractogenesis of radiation. You have enough little tiny things hitting the lens of the eye, eventually the lens will start to look cloudy. Right? It's as simple as that. They're determined by the dose. Now stochastic effects are the one that's a little bit weirder, right? Um, Stochastic is more like a trip to Tunica, right? Um, so imagine that uh, we're sitting there at the roulette table or whatever, and we're calling different numbers, right? Every time we spin the wheel, there's a chance that the ball will land on our number, right? The same is happening. The same kind of chance interaction is occurring every time we interact with radiation. So every time you get an x-ray, you're rolling the, you're, you're turning the roulette wheel, right? It's a completely random effect. The number may never land on you. It may land on you three times, right? So um, we, these are purely random, right? Um, now, the more I play roulette, the more likely is that eventually I will win, right? If I continue to play roulette, even if I'm the worst roulette player ever, chances are eventually, a few times, I will win. The same is true with x-rays. The more I get x-rays, the more likely eventually one of these effects will become apparent, right? So what are the kinds of stochastic effects that we're concerned with? Cancer and genetic mutation are the two big ones, right? Cancer and genetic mutation. So again, going back to what do our patients think when we talk about radiation dose and radiation effect? Most of them are thinking about the dude with the weird hands, right? They're thinking about mutants and, and, and things like that. They've conflated deterministic effects with stochastic effects, right? Um, the primary thing that we're concerned with is cancer. That's both for us as occupationally exposed individuals and our patients, right? So the math is very, very simple. In terms of if you have a patient and they're concerned about their radiation exposure for today's exam, the main risk associated with medical use of radiation is the development of cancer, right? That's the main risk. It's a completely random risk, right? That's the number one risk. Um, that risk of cancer would take upwards of 60 years to come true. Right? The cancer development would take a long time, with a few exceptions. It would take a long time. So the choices today for, for most patients is, 
do I get the CT scan or the x-ray or the nuclear medicine study that lets me know if I'm having a stroke or lets me know if I've got um, this chronic disease or lets me know if I have this acute condition, this trauma, that I've broken my arm or whatever, or do I not, right? It's as simple as that. So um, most parts, it is very, very easy to justify the risks by the benefits related to therapeutic use of radiation and uh, imaging, diagnostic imaging. But is this there in the back of our patients' minds anytime we talk about radiation? Yes, it is. So far, there have not been um, any detected genetic mutations caused by radiation in human populations. So I'll tell you that. No detected genetic mutations that have been passed on from one generation to the next, right? And also underscores the significance of radiophobia. Radiophobia was a term that was applied to radiation shortly after the use of the atomic bombs in the late 1940s. In fact, this picture here is a forgery. This is not in any way related to radiation of any kind. It was just a Photoshop effect. Um, so it's important to understand that people have heard some weird stuff about the effects of radiation. Some of it they've chosen to be afraid of and chosen to kind of make a big deal of, and some of it um, is not real at all, right? In fact, I would say a large amount of it's not real at all. Interestingly enough, radiation and the radiation's effects on the body is the most studied um, iatrogenic um, substance or toxic substance um, in the world. We know more about radiation's effects on the cells of the body than anything else, right? Than Coca-Cola, for example, or um, hairspray, or pumping our own gasoline, or using spray paint. All of those things, do they have effects on the body, both deterministic and stochastic? Yes, they do. They all have deterministic and stochastic effects on the body. But we know more about radiation than any of those other things. So the reason I stress that is because when we're doing this type of research, when we're trying to understand it, there's a lot that we don't know because there's so many other variables. There's so many other things that can cause damage um, that we don't fully understand. Not necessarily comforting to patients, um, but it is helpful for us to be aware that what the science that we're dealing with is kind of a spooky science, right? And to that point, Knowing, so the question is, how do we know what we know, right? The little that we do know, or the relatively a lot that we know, where do we learn it from? Now, I've already alluded to the fact that not everything that we know was ethically acquired, that there was some research that was done that was unethical, right? There was some research that was done because it was necessary, right? Necessary research. And so our textbook looks at two times when the research was absolutely necessary. We needed to do the research because we had question marks, it was a public health concern, and the first one that we'll look at is Three Mile Island. So this happened um, when I was very, very young, right? That, um, but it was something that I was aware of, right? Even at a young age, it was a big deal at the time. Um, that in the late 1970s, a pump, a water pump, stopped working at a water-cooled reactor in Three Mile Island, right? And what a, the way a nuclear power reactor works is it's basically a giant steam engine. It's producing steam. And the way it's producing steam is you have these uranium rods that are super hot, and you put them close to graphite. The graphite reflects the neutrons back at the uranium, and it causes them to fission. So they, they become even hotter, right? The closer they are to the graphite, the hotter they get, right? And it creates this kind of creepy blue glow, right? In addition to that, it creates a tremendous amount of heat, and that heat, if you have the graphite and uranium in water, can produce steam. So what you see if you drive past a, a nuclear power plant is a giant steam stack. What's being given off is tremendous amounts of steam that's powering a turbine, and that turbine's producing electricity. So what's interesting about that process is all that's being released into the Earth's atmosphere from a nuclear power plant is a tremendous amount of steam, right? Just water vapor, that's it. 
So in terms of a pollutant, the nuclear power plant is the least polluting form of energy in the world, right? Unless something happens to the core, unless something happens to the uranium. So in this case, um, the water continued to heat up. It got hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, and the pressure increased more and more and more. Um, and the core eventually melted down. It got so hot that that uranium and graphite core fused together and, and overheated and started to actually melt through the, through the bottom of the power plant into the earth. That's how hot it got. It got as, roughly as hot as the sun. So it got very, very hot. And the stuff, this lava that's now pouring into the earth is radioactive lava. That's a problem, right? So the, uh, now the buildings were built with shielding around them. And that's going to be an important thing to understand, that these buildings had shielding around them. They had a containment unit beneath the, uh, the reactor. And so um, they were allowed to hold some of this radioactive gas that's being released, right? So they caught some of it. There was a little bit that was released into the atmosphere, approximately 15 curies of iodine-131. It is nothing you would want to inhale directly that would kill you on the spot, right? But it was released into the atmosphere, right? 15 curies, right? Um, as well as some xenon and krypton. Uh, and let me move this slide up. And some of it, a very, very small amount was leaked into the groundwater around Three Mile Island. A very small amount. Like, I don't think it was even measurable. So most of what was released was released into the atmosphere, iodine-131. Iodine-131 can be linked to thyroid cancer. Why would that be the case? Yeah, the thyroid likes iodine. So if iodine's brought into the body, the thyroid wants it. So you'll notice, um, I don't know if you've seen the miniseries Chernobyl or whatever, one of the first things you can do if you suspect that there's a nuclear power plant disaster, start taking iodine tablets, right? Why? Because it prevents iodine-131 from sticking around inside your body, right? Your body won't have an affinity for it. Your, your thyroid will be flushed with iodine. It will not need additional iodine. It will just excrete the radioactive iodine out of your body, right? Um, but the average dose received by about 2 million people living in that 50 mile radius was about 0 0.08 millisieverts, right? Roughly the same as a chest x-ray, right? Roughly the same as a chest x-ray is what they got as a result of a core meltdown at Three Mile Island. Now the, the big thing here, I said, is that this had a containment unit built around it. It had a, a concrete barrier it had lead-lined walls, it had special water traps, it had all sorts of ways of trapping the radiation. Even if the gases escaped, it could be held in a portion of the facility and things like that. Nevertheless, this was a significant public health scare and it, it spawned a lot of discussion here in the United States about was, radiation, was nuclear power plants safe? Um, what sorts of things should we avoid? Where should we not have uh, radioactive power plants? And here's an actual joke thing that resulted from that original canned radiation from Three Mile Island. Um, it can be used as an air freshener, be used as toothpaste, all of those types of things. And the interesting thing about it is we use radiation for some of these things. Like I've mentioned, we use radiation as a tooth whitener in dentures. All right, let's contrast that with Chernobyl. So we learned a little bit about what happens when a core meltdown occurs, what happens to the surrounding population, um, how do we prevent these types of things in the future. And we've not had another event, incident like Three Mile Island since then. That's almost, what, 50 years ago, right? Over 50 years ago. And we've not had another incident like that here in the United States of America. So we learned quite a bit from it, right? The research was helpful. All right, let's talk about something that was a very, very different event. A very, 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 very different event. On April 26, 1986, there was an explosion of a nuclear power plant and a weapons factory. And the significant thing about what was occurring at Chernobyl 
is that it was unshielded. There was no shielding around it. So Three Mile Island had tremendous amounts of shielding around it. This had zero shielding, zero. In addition, I don't know if you've ever been in those parts of like East Tennessee or Kentucky coal country where you can like, like buy your gas, where you can buy your fireworks, right? And your guns or something. That's kind of what the Soviets had going on at Chernobyl. Chernobyl was, they were refining uranium to make nuclear weapons in the same facility that they were producing nuclear power, right? That is equivalent to kind of pumping gas while smoking a cigarette. Eventually, that's going to lead to some interesting results, right? Um, which is precisely what happened on uh, April 26, 1986. There was a huge fire and an explosion. It released 46 mega curies, right? So 15 curies from Three Mile Island because there was a contam there was a containment unit versus 46 mega curies of a whole huge weird buffet of stuff, right? Not just iodine-131, um, so that's 46 megacuries of iodine-131, 136 megacuries of xenon gas that was radioactive, um, 2.3 megacuries of cesium-137 that is still there contaminating the woods around Chernobyl, and in fact it contaminated the entire northern hemisphere of our planet, right? So there was nothing in the northern hemisphere of the planet Earth that wasn't impacted to some degree by Chernobyl, by the explosion at Chernobyl, right? Um, so the question is, again, how do we prevent this? Shielding apparently was super helpful. Maybe we shouldn't have avoided the step of shielding, right? But there's other questions as well, and so we're continuing to research that. And the bigger question is, what are the effects of this? What are the long-term effects of this? And so I want to show you all a quick video. It's thyroid cancer. So, roughly a, question? roughly a million times the amount of radioactive material was released um, as in comparison with Three Mile Island, right? I think that wording is wrong. Um, so, a million times the amount of radioactivity as released by Three Mile Island, right? Because of the lack of containment around the facility. This was 40, 30 to 40 times the radioactivity than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined, right? So I, I said the number one effect of those nuclear bombs going off was a tremendous shock wave and an explosion, right? It was not radiation. The number one effect of Chernobyl was radiation. And so even though the explosion wasn't as big as um, Hiroshima or Nagasaki, the amount of contamination that resulted was 30 to 40 times both of those bombs, right? About, so 50 to 56 deaths are directly attributed to Chernobyl. Some of this is still held in some secrecy. So the Russians still haven't released all the information on this. Um, it was a big black eye, in fact, uh, the, uh, the premier of Russia at that time, Gorbachev, said that this is what ended, this is what ended the USSR, was Chernobyl. Um, so the World Health Organization, though, has said that roughly uh, uh, 4,000 to 8,000 people could die as a result of the stochastic effects of Chernobyl. 4,000 to 8,000 people, somewhere in there. Um, and the main adverse effect is thyroid cancer. I wanted to show you all these things because I, I had the opportunity to do some training at Oak Ridge, which was America's secret city. It was here in the state of Tennessee. And during World War I, it was where they enriched the plutonium that they used in the in Fat Man and the Little Boy, right, um, in the bombs. And uh, so there's all these enrichment facilities and stuff, and it still is very much like a, a brain trust. It feels a bit like you're in the movie Stranger, or the show Stranger Things or something. It's a, it's a Department of Energy site. Um, but at that facility, uh, while I was doing training, we did some gamma spec where we would look at um, these things. We would look at uh, them under devices that allowed us to measure the energy of the gamma rays coming off of them. The first thing that we're looking at is some tea from Turkey, right, that was contaminated with cesium-137. So you think about how far Turkey is from the Ukraine, it would be about the same as 
um, being in Miami and something blowing up in Seattle, right, and affecting the crops, affecting the orange groves in Miami, right? So that's about how far away they are from each other. Now the other thing, uh, the, the button there is an actual button from Chernobyl nuclear power plant that was contaminated again with cesium-137. Yeah. Yeah, some of that's been sensationalized, yes. Um, so if you look, if you do kind of a, there's some creepy stuff you can see, like babies of Chernobyl type stuff, right? Um, so there were some effects on children related to Chernobyl. Um, primarily, they had a decreased, uh, they had a mental impairment, right? It was the number one thing that was directly related to Chernobyl. Um, some of that other stuff, I think, is sensationalist. Um, but we will look at that more, right? So that, that is a good question to be asking. Now, a lot of this is according to scientific folks, right? And so you can kind of choose to think, who, who are you going to trust on this? Because you'll hear totally different things. Like, there's certain folks, uh, environmentalist groups, and I'm not opposed to environmentalists thinking about this, but I've heard some grossly misquoted statistics about Chernobyl before. Like one person once told me that t roughly 10,000 people died at Chernobyl. That's simply not true, right? Um, so we can talk about there are people, a lot of thousands of people who were affected by it, but that actually died there, were burned up or something like that. It was about 50, right? That's what the direct uh, deterministic effects. And so we need to, I think we need to rely that much more on the science, right? And when it comes to radiation protection, some of the best people that we can rely on are the International Commission on Radiologic Protection, right? Um, what they do is they look at all the effects of radiation, they think um, hard about it, and they think about what are ways that we can have protection from radiation exposure while at the same time harnessing some of the benefits, right? And so I think that question of, Risks with benefits is the best way that we can frame this for our patients and the best way we can frame it for ourselves. So the ICRP creates the science and makes provisions um, that is then uh, looked at by the NCRP, the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements that's here in the United States of America. And again, these are scientists. They're looking at clinical significance of radiation and uh, determined uh, deterministic effects, how dose limits sh could reduce those effects, and how to best limit stochastic effects, those random effects, while at the same time still getting benefits from the use of this energy. In this slide, oh, let me move it down just a little bit. So there's a lot of things that can expose people to radiation. If we just said, you know what, no more radiation for anyone, right? We would have to limit a lot of stuff. There's a lot of consumer products that contain radioactive material. In fact, all of our clothes was probably examined with cesium-137 to make sure that the clothes was well made, right? Um, all of our roads that we drive on, when they build the roads, they use cesium-137 to make sure that the road bed is well laid, right? Air travel results in exposure to increased amounts of cosmic radiation. Um, there's nuclear power, nuclear fuel for the generation of more power. So when I lived in Utah, there were places in Utah where uranium mining was occurring, right? You would not want to hang around in those places. Um, there's atmospheric fallout from nuclear weapons testing, nuclear power plant accidents like what we just talked about. Um, then nuclear power plant accidents as a consequence of natural disasters is what we're talking about with Fukushima Daiichi, medical radiation, and then all those little weird My Little Ponies that we can't predict, right? There's all the other stuff. So we deal in approximates because there's some stuff that, frankly, is maybe contributing to this that we still don't understand how it's contributing to this. Like a few years ago, there was a question about whether cell phones were causing it, right? Um, it wound up being disproven, but... Okay. 
The first scientific thing that I want to point us to as being very, 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 very helpful is NCRP report number 160. So this was released in 2009, and it looks at U.S. public radiation exposures and compares between 1987, so shortly after Chernobyl, to 2006, fairly recently. And it has not been updated, but the big findings with this is that there was a significant increase in public exposure due to medical imaging procedures such as CT and nuclear medicine stuff, as well as, nu as interventional. <clears throat> this just gives us some additional stuff about it. I don't think it really adds much to it. Um, but it was looking particularly at how usage patterns have changed. Um, and the number one way that usage patterns have changed is within the hospital. So here it is broken out. Natural background radiation is three millisieverts. Probably if we went back a million years ago and sampled natural background radiation, my guess is it would be three millisieverts. Because when they did the report in 1987, it was three millisieverts, right? Um, medical radiation is now um, 3.2 millisieverts. So medical radiation exposures to the US public more than exceed natural background radiation. Um, all other man-made exposures contribute about 0.1 millisievert annually. So the total amount of average radiation exposure for the average US citizen in 2006, 6.3 millisieverts annually. I'm gonna zoom in on this real quick. This is looking at all the different types of radiation exposure. So the green wedge up there um, and the yellow wedge and the purple wedge at the very top, these are all the natural radiation exposures right here, plus this gigantic wedge right here. What is this gigantic wedge? Radon. So radon contributes a lot to people's natural background radiation. And radon varies depending on where you live, right? So here in Memphis, we do not have high amounts of radon in our basements or in our soil, right? In East Tennessee, there are people who literally can't use their basements because the radon levels are so high, right? So we'll look a little bit more at that. But you'll notice if we were, so roughly half of this pie chart is all the natural stuff, right? Everything down here, is the artificial sources of radiation, right? And you'll notice two of the two biggest pieces of the pie are CT and nuclear medicine, right? CT and nuclear medicine. So what happened? How did we jump up so much, right? And what they realized, um, if you look at the previous report from 19, the 1980s, Medical radiation contributed 0.54 millisieverts, right? The big thing that changed was CT, right? The big thing that changed was CT. Uh, when I, so I, I, I kind of lived through this. We went from, they didn't order CTs, but like once in a blue moon, to literally they were ordering CTs every five minutes, right? Which is pretty much where we live now. Um, we just really like CT. Um, a lot of that was driven, frankly, by lawsuits. Person comes into the ER for a headache. Doctor says, okay, you know, take uh, two aspirin, call me in the morning. In the morning, the patient doesn't call because they've had a stroke, right? Now, you're, now your butt's getting sued. Why didn't you do the CT scan, right? Um, so I worked with numerous physicians who would just order CTs on every headache that came in because of the fear of lawsuit. So medical radiation, x-ray machines, radio pharmaceuticals, and medicine um, are going to be the two largest uh, contributors to artificial radiation exposure to the U.S. public. So why are we making such a big deal out of this? Um, because we're not tracking it. With Chernobyl and with Three Mile Island, we had a whole lot of scientists that convened on those places and started tracking the heck out of what was occurring. Right? So the miniseries Chernobyl looks at one person, 
but really there was there was over 200 scientists that came to Chernobyl to figure out what was occurring, how to fix it, right? 200 scientists at just that one site. Um, we've got basically zero scientists at every facility in America that's exposing the U.S. public to radiation. We're not tracking it. The only facility that I know of is St. Jude, right? They track doses on every single patient. So we're not capturing the data, right? And I think that's unethical. Like, I think that's something that needs to change. There needs to be a way that we're capturing this, that a person's dose profile goes with them across their lifetime, and that we're harnessing the effects of what's happening with medical radiation. And the reason for that is because we don't understand very much about this genetic piece. We understand the cancer piece, and we can predict it based on a person's repeated exposures. And that, a lot of that data comes from this, the research that came out of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We're able to talk about cancer, and we're pretty accurate about it. We do are not as good at predicting genetic damage, right? Um, in terms of how do we limit it, we limit people's exposure, right, um, and by having effective policy in place. And the big thing is, is limiting the widespread substitution of unnecessary medical imaging exams. That came from the scientists at the NCRP. They said, are all these CTs really necessary, right? I found that incredibly vindicating for me because as a CT tech, I was sitting there wondering, why the heck are we doing all these CT scans on all these people? Okay. So we cannot control our exposure to natural background radiation. We have no control over that. But we can limit our exposure to artificial sources of radiation. So again, uh, well, that's, uh, it looks like that's a duplicated slide. I'll just forward. So, again, the use of radiation in medicine, super beneficial, right? Um, I can't, I don't want you to hear me say that all medical radiation is bad or something like that. That's not what I'm getting at. But we, the benefit to risk ratio is huge, right? When those exams are ordered for the appropriate reason or when those uh, therapeutic procedures are done for the appropriate reason. So, at the end of the day, patients are like, what does all this mean for me, right? How do we, uh, how do we work with this, our understanding of it? First off, we should let them know that our hospital has policies that limit the amount of radiation that they're exposed to. There's policies in place that guide our use, right? Um, we're working to enhance our technology. This machine that we're using today does a, a lot, helps me limit your radiation exposure, right? Um, we should have goals established for specific, lowering dose for specific procedures, right? That's more of a future consideration, but we should start that conversation now, right? Um, safety should be in the budget. It's currently not, right? Apart from budgeting for an RSO, most facilities do not budget for additional safety considerations. It's the last thing that we do. And if at all possible, we should have documentation in place. And there is now a means required by the federal government to document excessive radiation dose. So we are now tracking people who have been exposed to too much radiation, particularly the number one way that it occurs is during certain cardiocath procedures. Okay. If, though, a patient's asking you, what does all this mean to me, I would fall back on NCRP report number 160 and say, over close to half of your radiation exposure comes from the natural environment, right? Um, the majority of the way that you're exposed to radiation is out there. It is part of the environment. The benefits of today's exams are that we can figure out if you're having a stroke, or we can figure out if you have cancer, we can figure out if you have a broken bone, right? Um, I won't make you do this activity right now, but it is helpful to think about benefits related to things, particularly before you interact with a patient so that you can just rattle off a number of benefits related to their specific exam. Who here has, has had a patient ask them about radiation related to the procedure that they're doing? So a few of us, right? And it's helpful to go ahead and have an ex a, a 
something in place, right? We have policies that limit dose. We're using the state-of-the-art equipment, right? Um, it is part of the natural environment, but we're going to reduce the risks as much as possible while still getting the benefits of this procedure. Mentioning to them these principles of ALARA, that we keep things as low as reasonably achievable, and the ways that we do that is we limit the time that you're around the radiation, we increase the distance from the radiation source, and we increase shielding when at all possible. So the room that we're standing in is a lead-lined room, like in the radiation treatment vault. This treatment door is designed to protect us from the radiation. We're going to be here watching you the whole time that we're doing the procedure so that we can limit the amount of dose to just what is needed. But a final thing that's very, very helpful is this BERT thing, the background equivalent radiation time. And this is the type of thing that if we need a way to quickly tell a patient what the expected dose is, is to relate it back to what occurs in the Earth's environment. So one way to talk about it is the chest x-ray is about like a flight to Paris. Um, we could also say a chest x-ray is about 10 days of natural background radiation. Compared with a chest CT, which is like 8,000 days of natural background radiation. Anywhere from two to three years of natural background radiation. And the final thing that we should help the patient understand is that I can't just get rid of the dose altogether. Um, we could drop the dose and get really crappy pictures. So the question is one of diagnostic efficacy, right? Um, what degree of radiation is needed in order to detect the presence of disease, right? So we talk about optimizing the dose, justifying the procedure that we're doing, and limiting the exposed population. We don't, uh, mom doesn't need to be in the room, or your cousin doesn't need to be in the room while we're doing the procedure. Now, these things do map onto each other, and one thing I want to point out um, that I would hope would change over time, so this is looking at a different NCRP report, and this is what guides our dose limits as occupationally exposed individuals. This is NCRP report number 116. The effective dose limit annually is 50 millisieverts for all occupationally exposed individuals, right? 50 millisieverts annually. Look at the ICRP report number 60. So if you're working in Spain or Greece or Europe, your dose limit is 20 millisieverts annually, right? I, given what I, everything that I've just told you today, I think there's a case to be made, like, how come I'm not getting paid extra, right? But my dose limit is more than twice what I would expect if I was working in Spain, right? Um, in fact, in, in Spain in particular, you get a hazard benefit for working as an x-ray tech or the radiation therapist. So I think there's ways that we could continue to improve our policy here in the United States of America. Okay, and if you're still worried about nuclear fallout from World War III, um, there's a video there for you that will answer your questions about that. All right. <clears throat>